الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وزوجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly and we ask Allah to exalt the mention, grant peace and send the salutations and his blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon his companions, upon his wives, and all those who follow them on their path of righteousness until the day of recompense. This is a moment which I have been avoiding and anticipating for a while. I know that sounds uh, conflicting, just like the title. The title is an oxymoron. Does anyone know what an oxymoron is? It's when you have two conflicting ideas in one expression. Like a small big guy. Doesn't work. The ambiguous bayina. It doesn't work. Because bayina is that clarity. The straightforwardness. And ambiguous is lack of clarity. Confusion. So it doesn't add up. But there's a reason behind the title. And similarly, how can I anticipate and avoid this particular moment? I have reasons for both. The reason why I've been avoiding it is because the very concept of having to discuss other individuals involved in da'wah is not necessarily the ideal topic of a lecture, honestly. We would prefer if Allah had decreed for this ummah to be in a different condition that the only thing we communicate with the people is how to return to Allah, how to increase their faith, how to worship Allah. For sure, that would be the ideal situation. But the reality doesn't support us. You cannot. At times, you have to discuss these matters that bring a lot of heat. And of course, the intentions of the person who is involved in this are always questioned. As we will discuss, jealousy, this and that, we will discuss that. So it's not the ideal situation. You would prefer, especially in the last 10 nights of Ramadan, that the topic would be different. We would prefer that it would be different. However, the issues happen in Ramadan, so we have to address them in Ramadan. If some Muslims were afflicted by some calamity, earthquake in a neighboring country and they need our support, do we tell them, Wallahi, it's the last ten nights of Ramadan, let us finish our ibadah, celebrate Eid, and inshallah we will be there for you as soon as we're done. No. You will go for their aid instantly. I say, the spiritual well-being of the Muslims, the protection of their belief system is superior to their physical well-being and we cannot wait until the damage is greater before an action is taken because there will be many victims in the process so we're forced to do this in these blessed nights however we will see that this is also part of the deen it's not like we're doing something haram altogether like okay let's do conspiracy we'll do haram at the last and that's mafi mushkila it's not as you will see why inshallah as for the anticipation it's because this falls under a principle in our deen that is well established in the Quran and the Sunnah and the understanding of our righteous predecessors, which is a deen al nasiha. Religion is good advice. And that entails that anything which may harm the believers and their belief from any type of source, internal source, external source, Going against it, exposing it, speaking about it, is part of our struggle fi sabilillah. Is part of our struggle fi sabilillah. This is supported by the statement of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah. Qila li Ahmad bin Hanbal, ar-rajul yasumu wa yusalli wa ya'takif. Ahabu ilayka aw yatakallam fi ahli al-bid'a. He was, it was said to him, a man 
he prays and he fasts and he secludes himself in the worship of Allah, atikaf. Is that more beloved to you or him speaking about the people of innovation? He said, إِذَا قَامَ وَصَلَّ وَعْتَكَفْ فَإِنَّمَا هُوَ لِنَفْسِهِ His salah, his siyam, his atikaf is for his own well-being. It's good for him. وَإِذَا تَكَلَّمَ فِي أَهْلِ الْبِدْعَ فَإِنَّمَا هُوَ لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ وَهَذَا أَفْضَلْ However, if he has to, and again, we will, we will uh, qualify these statements. So my advice is whoever is here in this lecture live or will hear it later on YouTube, don't, don't rush into conclusions. For the sake of Allah, hear me out for this one hour. You will see that there's a balanced approach to this, inshallah. This is not by any means some, some attack. It is not. So hear me out. Until the end, if you disagree, you're entitled to that. We will respect that difference. So he said, as for speaking about the people of innovation, then this is better. This is for the Muslims and this is superior. We're not saying that everyone should abandon siyam and salah and atikaf and go fetch for these things to you know, do it. No, this is not for everyone and this is not what is intended. This is in particular situations like the one we're in right now. There's haja, there's a need for it. If there's no need, don't do it because we have some people who, whose need doesn't end. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Around the clock, they continue to, if there's nothing, they invent things. They will come up with things just so they can maintain this methodology. We say this is extreme. We're saying when there's a haja. So, <clears throat> and Shaykh Al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah further supports this approach. He was asked about ghibah, backbiting, one of the kaba'ir. Because it entails eating the flesh of your brother, right? It's in the Quran. No one can undermine ghibah. He said, is it permissible for particular people or a particular person? And what is the ruling on that? Give us a simplified answer so that those who are involved in enjoining what is good for and forbidding what is evil will each apply this as per his knowledge. He said, Rahimahullah, أَمَّا الشَّخْصُ الْمُعَيَّنْ فَيُذْكَرْ مَا فِيهِ مِنَ الشَّرِّ فِي مَوَاضِعِ As for a particular person, it may be that you have to mention whatever evil might be around, involved with that person in certain conditions, such as al-mazloom. If, if he's wronging someone, then you might have to mention the wrongdoings of the oppressor. وَمِنْهَا أَنْ يَكُونُ عَلَى وَجْهِ النَّصِيحَةِ لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ فِي دِينِهِمْ وَدُنْيَاهُمْ And there are other conditions when this falls under the general advice for the Muslims in the matters of their dunya and their religion. And of course, Imam Nawawi, rahimahullah, in his exceptions of ghibah, one of the exceptions of ghibah is that. If you're forced to mention certain things, not to defame the person. It's not character assassination as some would like to title it. Rather only so that the people can be careful and for that person perhaps to be rectified. That is the intent and that is among the exceptions. So this is just part of, this is why there's that anticipation. Because it's about time. Now before I delve into this topic, I have four disclaimers. And I say and I beg whoever is listening, do not listen to this lecture without these disclaimers. I don't want anyone at some point to make excerpts from this lecture huh, where I am, for example, uh, speaking in a particular, let's say, offensive way or I'm, I'm overexcited. They take out this clip and send it to Fulan. So Fulan says, oh no, why is this guy happening that, doing this? We don't want that stuff. I want you to hear the whole lecture. Either whole, listen to the whole thing or don't listen to anything. Because it's all cohesive. There's a, a complete message. Sometimes when you quote out of context, you make more damage than good. And we know this with the Christians. When they took one statement of mine about, uh, you know, Ibn Qayyim Jawziya's statement that saying Merry Christmas to someone is worse than uh, murder and fornication and so on and so forth. This went crazy among them because they just only took that one part. And it, if you're listening to a, a da'wah for the first time and the person is telling you, well, according to your religion, you know, if you say Merry Christmas to someone, it's worse than fornication and murder, their mind will just not digest it. I, I understand. I put myself in the shoes. I would not understand it either because that was taken out of context. It has to be understood in the right context. So what are the disclaimers? The first disclaimer, whoever thinks that the reason behind these 
clarifications is jealousy. We hear this a lot. Oh, they're jealous. Fulan is jealous of Fulan. So he wrote an article against him. He made a lecture against him. I say this is insane. It's insane. I cannot imagine a da'ya, someone who is calling people to Allah. And when we call people to Allah, what is the ultimate objective? That we all go to Jannah. That is the objective. The means, we don't care about the means, as long as they are halal. The individuals, we don't care about that either. Every da'ya's intention is the well-being of a Muslim. So if I'm unable to do it, he's able to do it, we're happy. We're happy. So to claim that there's some sort of jealousy, that he's got more fans on Facebook, and all because of the age we're living. It's, it's ridiculous. Oh, he looked at his uh, number of you know, followers on Facebook. He's like, how do I ramp up mine? So let me make a lecture refuting him. I'll have more you know, fans. Of, this, is, this is retarded. I'm sorry. I don't think any die in this world, no matter how insincere he can be, can even go down to this level. Subhanallah, we want the well-being of the Muslims. And the evidence to support that is that I was the person who recommended this brother. Of course, you know, we're talking about Nu'man Ali Khan. I was the one who recommended him when I discovered his tafsir way back. If this was about jealousy, then you wouldn't even mention another da'i. You wouldn't even mention it. Why give him popularity, give him exposure, keep him hidden, no one should know about him, only me. This is not how a da'i thinks. So anyone whose first idea is, this is because of jealousy, we say, fear Allah. You did not go into the intentions of any one of the du'at who might have spoken about this recent issue for you to say that he is doing it out of jealousy. You have no right to say that about any da'i. And I defend anyone who spoke about this matter. And the good assumption entails that no one did this out of jealousy. It could be uh, ex uh, over excitement. It could be right. It could be wrong. Each one has his own situation. But jealousy is definitely not one of them. Unless the da'i admits, I am jealous of him and therefore I made this clarification, then Allah yahdi na yahdi. So uh, yeah, we want the goodness for the people. The second disclaimer, um, and this is something you hear a lot. And it's, you're right, the people who don't know any better, you know, of course, you know, one person writes an article or, or a post on Facebook and you have 2,000 comments. Then when you, when you see the comments, the notion you get is, why are you doing this in front of everybody? Why can't y'all just fix your problems on your own and spare us the headache? And I say, you're right. Wallahi, you're right. And we tried, but it didn't work. This issue, I have been in contact with this brother, may Allah bless him and forgive us and forgive him for over a year, including a phone conversation, a lengthy one, trying to get to the bottom of this. Why? Because for the Muslims, ideally, they don't have to know all the problems that exist. We should just make the, the simplified message in a sense, so just they know the crux of the matter. They don't need to go into why what happened and why it happened and who said to who and who said to what. This is actually confusing to the masses. However, when no other means were found to resolve the issue or you tried to resolve it, you know, behind closed doors and it didn't work, then what do you do? So in case anyone is tripping, as they say, an attempt was already made to resolve this issue in privacy and it met a dead end. And therefore now the clarification has to be made public because I had endorsed Fulan. I had said, watch, listen to him. And that things have changed a lot since I made that statement. And I can't just keep it like that. Until now, people keep telling me, well, you said we should listen to him. And now he said this and he did, the, he did, he did that. So what is your opinion on that? And it becomes difficult to tell each person, well, Akhi, I said this back then. And, you know, I'm just repeating the same old tape. So one lecture should address this issue after having attempted to fix this problem behind closed doors. Thirdly, there's no personal issue with this brother. From the email communication and the phone conversation, he's an extremely, extremely kind person. Honestly, very nice, very uh, respectful, very tolerant, you know, in his speech, in his words, in his show, everything. This is not a personal issue or personal conflict and now we're putting da'wah as the victim of two personalities conflicting. None of that stuff. 
And we seek refuge with Allah from this lowliness. There is no personal issue. This is merely because of two things. Number one, we hope and pray because of the position Allah Azza wa has granted him that he sees some of the issues that will be highlighted and he rectifies them for the sake of Allah and, this for, and afterwards for the sake of the Muslims who are nothing but ears. And you know, we are living in an age of celebrity status and people being overly obsessed with the speakers so to, to the point that they don't see anything except what they want to see. They don't see if even if you mention fault, they refuse to believe that they exist. And I will mention some of these inshallah in a little bit. And the second thing is uh, the followers of any speaker who might be mentioned, they understand, they should understand why there is an issue to begin with among the du'at. Why more than one person involved in da'wah had spoken about this recent matter and what the issue is. They need to know so that they can be upon bayina. They can see things the way they need to be seen. Then Allah guides whomever He wills. We're not going to twist people's arms into anything. But after the clarification is made, then Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, this is the, the hujjah. You establish the hujjah, the balagh al-mubeen, then Allah Azza wa Jal yahdi man yashaw ila sirat al-mustaqeem. We have no control over who's guided and who's not. But it has to be made. And the fourth disclaimer is that in this clarification of mine, I have not followed the methodology of certain extremists who quote people out of context. Meaning there has been issues for some time and we have certain people that make videos like a six minute video, seven minute video where they take parts of the brother's speech huh? and they kind of paste them together in a way wherein the message he's saying is different than the one you watch in that six minute video is different than the actual. And I was just shocked. This is why in order to be fair with the brother, brother Nu'man, and before Allah to be just, I w went out of my way to watch the whole lectures. Or at least if time, because mashallah there's plenty, if time then at least 10 minutes before and 10 minutes after that quotation to understand things in the right context. So we will not misquote or we will not oppress or we will say no, that's not what he intended. He was saying this just before that you didn't hear it as some of the people. We did, I did not follow this methodology. We gave him the benefit of the doubt in everything. But sometimes when you listen to the whole lecture, the overall message is sometimes worse than the snippet that the people are freaking out about. And this is why they're going to be highlighted. طيب. So let us agree that this is not merely a compilation of some random errors wherein we try to demonize the brother and say he's pure evil and he's misguiding the people and he's taking people to Jahannam and he is this and he is that. This is not the intention. We do not deny and I do not deny the good, the plenty of good that has happened on the hands of this brother. We cannot deny that. This is the adil which Allah Azza wa Jal expects of us. A lot of good has happened from his da'wah, no doubt. At the same time, there are some issues that could compromise or could affect that good da'wah which has taken place. Either because a mixed message is being given right now or because there was something in the past and now it's changing. It's, the, the message is changing. So what might have been good before is not necessarily good now. Why? Because people are not consistent in their stance. This is why our righteous predecessors used to say, take knowledge from the dead. If you want to take knowledge, take knowledge from the dead. Why? He said, because the living one, لا تؤمن عليه الفتنة. You cannot trust that he will not be trialed. He will not be tested. He will not deviate from the path. Does it happen? Of course. If it happens. And therefore, this is not trying to demonize. We admit the good that is out there. And we hope that it increases while rectifying the other serious issues. So that the Muslims can benefit from the overall message. So you will not learn something about the book of Allah in a very advanced, uh, well understood in many cases, tafsir. But in the process, you wind up losing your aqidah or your understanding of aqidah. You wind up losing aspects of your uh, respect to, to the book of Allah, respect to the scholars or other things. We don't want you to get, we don't want the Muslims to get confused. They benefit in some way and they're harmed in another way. Sometimes that harm and more often than not, the harm exceeds the benefit. 
You can have a delicious cake with a little bit of poison. And even though you eat the whole cake and enjoy it, you, the eventual result is death. It's just a little bit of poison, but it kills you. So while we appreciate the cake, we need the poison to be extracted. It has to be taken out. In defense of the brother, in defense of the brother Nu'man Ali Khan, I personally think he's the victim of three things. He is the victim of three things. Number one, the pseudo Salafis. Our brothers who follow the methodology of the Salaf, however, have gone to extreme. And as we know from the article he wrote to explain that clip in Surah Yaseen, his reasoning behind everything is that he hung out with these people and then he, you know, he became all obsessed with refutations and this and that and he didn't find his heart, he only found the Qur'an so he abandoned those types of people. Very often, in their effort to dishonor someone or discredit that person, they go to extremes, as I said, in cutting and pasting to demonize the person we're in, they will never change. You make it difficult for them to change. So they have not helped. In many cases, they almost never help. They make the worst videos. And the biggest evidence is when they made a video, that one of them made a video and he put the clip where I recommended him. Then I got in contact with that person. Told him, Akhi, I retract my endorsement. Okay? Please take me out of the video where you're attacking him, where you're putting me among those who endorsed him. Please take it out. He said, no, the video is only like seven minutes. He said, no, I don't have time to make another video. So I'll just keep the video with you there. He, it's crazy, man. You don't fear Allah? I'm telling you, I'm the speaker. I am the speaker whom you're putting in the clip. I'm telling you, I don't want you to put my name there. I don't want to be part of the video. I take back my endorsement. Said, well, it's too much work. To now to have to edit another video and upload it without you, khalas, we'll keep it and we'll just put that you, you retracted that endorsement. Okay, this is dhulmi, akhi. So the way they approach these speakers who are out in the limelight, it makes them continue in their way. They become even more stubborn in their way. So he's a victim of those. And he's a victim of the innovators whom he has become very comfortable with. And, and this is where the balance is supposed to be. Tariq Jamil. Do you guys know Tariq Jamil? Or Dr. Israr Ahmed or Akram Nadawi and uh, Suhaib Webb. These individuals, may Allah guide us and guide them. I mean, their stuff is out in the public. There's nothing hidden there. They tell you exactly where they stand and their, their belief. Uh, you know, Tariq Jamil uh, explaining to the people the hadith about some crazy hadith about uh, why music's haram. He tells them a story about the Prophet ﷺ, uh, you know, who, who, uh, they wind up hearing songs, al muhim in Jannah. So the Prophet will sing, first Dawood will sing, then the Prophet will sing, then Allah will recite upon them. And it's a whole fabricated story. Fabricated story from the Tablighi Jama'at Manhaj which is fada'il amal, fada'il sadaqat, jumbo, mumbo, jumbo of every type of thing. Hadith sahih, hadith mawdu, hadith ayy kalam, yalla. Al-Muhum, make it sound too nice to the people and let them cry a little bit fi sabilillah with Mother Teresa and it's all good. Because you know, the religion is just about softening the hearts. No, it doesn't work this way. It doesn't work this way. So when, when he says this is his hero and there are videos of them sitting together with this, you know, very emotional state, when you mix with these individuals, what do you expect? Akram Nadawi who tells you, Aqeedah, what is this Aqeedah? You don't need no Aqeedah. All you need is Iman. So then you hear our brother Nu'man Khan reiterating, re relaying the same speech in his eloquent way. Where did he learn this from? He told us he learned it from him. He sat with him for six days, learned about the hadith, and learned how men and women used to mix, as I will explain in the lecture. So he is a victim of these individuals. Of these individuals he mixes with very freely in all these events and surely it will take its toll on you. That's why our Salaf were very clear about be careful who you sit with, be careful who you associate with. Some people think that we just quote them for the sake of nothing. This is a clear evidence about how accurate the Salaf were in their statements. Wallahi they're right. So we need to be, when you are in that environment, when you co lecturing with Habib al Jifri and Amr Khalid and Hamza Yusuf, what do you expect? And he's learning from these individuals because if you watch their clips and his clips, 
You see the same exact message, wallahi, identical, but with his special eloquence, with his special delivery, that's it. But it's the same core message that he got from all these individuals. So he's a victim of these people. If he were to abandon them, if he were mixing with them, fi sabil al-da'wa, alhamdulillah. You know, we say there's room that you may mix with them, hoping to bring them back. But we don't see this happening. We see a glorification of the people of bid'ah. As I will mention at the end of the khutbah, at the end of the lecture, inshallah. And so he's a victim of that. And the third thing, he's a victim of his celebrity status. And that is very difficult, ya akhwan. Because this is not Hollywood and Bollywood and it's not some cricket player. You know what I mean? This is da'wah. This is da'wah. This is calling people to Allah. And when a person calling people to Allah is put on a pedestal, on a particular position among the people that is way beyond the acceptable, it becomes very difficult for that person to see clearly. In his mind, this is support from Allah. Therefore, I must be right. So that celebrity status is very harmful. And who, who is to blame? We. The followers, the groupies, if you want to call them. Those who go out of their way, it's unbelievable, ya akhwan, unbelievable the comments that you read. NAK, he can never be wrong. Ya Shaykh, subhanallah. The Prophet وسلم, Allah said, Abasa wa tawalla. Lima tuharrima ahalla Allah. Like, what is wrong with you people? He's a human being, ya akhwan. Take it easy. When you, when you feed that ego, even if he doesn't have an ego, you're instilling ego in the, in the brother. Then when he hears people, you know, try to advise him, it's not gonna fly. Ah, this guy just hates me. Look at all these people, they love me. It doesn't work this way. We are the victim. We are the, the guilty ones, I'm sorry. And he's the victim of that. Had the people toned down a little bit, had they been, we, we don't have this in Islam. This over uh, uh, gl glorification of an individual, no matter who it is, except the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, huh? He would hate it if people stood up when he would enter. If he entered it on people and he's, they would not stand up, even though you will say, this is right now, by Allah, if the Messenger of Allah walked in, which one of you would remain seated and shake his hand? Would you be able to? You feel, what do you feel? You're compelled to get up, you will fall apart. The Sahaba who loved the Messenger of Allah more than we can ever love him would not get up because they knew how much he hated that. Why? It resembled the way of the kings and the, the royal families and what have you. They didn't like that stuff. What do we do now when we see him? Ah! You know, sisters. The sisters be crazy. What did you just see? Yani Richard Gere? Well, this is a brother given da'wah. Relax. Relax. Sit down. Where's your modesty? Where's your haya? This is for the sister. The brothers are even worse. The brothers are even worse. They go out of their way. You see a da'i, he's a regular person. Salam alaikum alaikum salam. Jazakallah khair wa jazak. Intahayna. Khalas intahayna. All this hyping up of the stuff, you're harming the brother. You're harming the da'i. The da'i, shaitan gets in his mind. You think the da'i yani, doesn't have any shayateen? He, he fought them all off before he came? And you know, the rest of the people have shayateen, the da'i is free from shayateen. He has more shayateen than the regular people. Because the shaitan wants to misguide the da'i. Because when misguiding him, he misguides thousands of people. Help the brother out, relax. All these followers are crazy. Crazy. In their commentary, in their comments, in their endorsements. Blinded with, with this love. What is the th reason? I was misguided, Allah guided me through him. How, how possibly can you speak ill about him? Our religion doesn't work this way. Our religion doesn't... Just because Allah guided you through someone does not mean that he becomes the next prophet in your life. It doesn't mean that he's guaranteed Jannah. It doesn't mean that he's guaranteed consistency upon the path until, the, until he dies. No one, no one is given that privilege in this ummah. No one. So the fact that Allah guided you through him doesn't mean anything really. Appreciate it, Jazakumullah khair. But don't go overboard in your endorsements. So he's a victim. I say he's a victim of these three things. Because of these three things, we have the issues we have. And perhaps those issues didn't exist back at the Tafsir al Amma. When things were cool and subtle, it was right. And then all of a sudden, things started picking up and picking up and picking up until we reached the state. Where it's getting worse lecture by lecture. 
lecture by lecture. Why? Because now there's a new ideology. My issue and the issue of the other du'at who have spoken about it is not a single incident. If you think we're so silly that we see one clip of three minutes where he said, Aqeedah is that important, then we go, oh, yalla, yalla. No, wallahi, you think we're crazy. We're not crazy. Nobody's that silly. We look at the overall package. When someone is giving da'wah, you don't go look for that one mistake. Wallahi, you will find hundreds of mistakes. No one is infallible from among the du'at. You will find them if you look for them. You look at the overall message. What is the outcome of that da'wah? If the outcome of the da'wah is understanding Islam as per the way of the righteous predecessors, while there are mistakes, ma fi mushkila. We are happy, alhamdulillah, and these mistakes will be addressed and rectified. But when the outcome is something other than that, any type of Islam that is not as per the way of the righteous predecessors, then you have to pull out the handbrake. Stop. Now we have to speak. Because of the overall message that is being communicated, not a mistake, not an error. And I observed clearly that it is not a single incident. It's what, ha what he has gone through intellectually and now is being relayed to the Muslims. When I mention some of these things, you will understand me better, inshallah. So I'll get there soon. Anyway, someone might, someone be, someone might be thinking or saying right now among his uh, you know, adamant followers, and who, who in the world are you? Right? And who are you anyways to be speaking about our brother Nu'man Ali Khan? Mr. Anonymous. I've never seen you before. Look at this young stupid kid. That's what they usually say. What are you, 15 years old, 16 years old? No, I'm 36. It doesn't matter. So why are you speaking about this? Uh, are you underqualified? If I were underqualified, according to the methodology of our brother Nu'man Khan and Suhaib Web, no, I'm not. Because as we see, as you'll see in the lecture, according to Nu'man Khan, we have made a big deal out of credentials. The man in Surah Yaseen, he didn't know anything. Huh? He came from Aqsa al-Madina, he gave da'wah, he didn't need any ijazah, didn't need anything. He just spoke. He just spoke, gave da'wah. So you don't need any ijazah. So Haybweb huh, called Nu'man Khan a shaykh al-allama. Do you understand the severity of this? You know what allama means? We don't even dare to say allama to any imam of the masjid, not even the mufti. Even the mufti, huh? you will be a little careful before you give him the title allama. Allama is not alim, it's like many alims in one. That requires extensive knowledge of everything in the deen. Huh? Not just knowing the Quran, knowing, knowing Arabic language. Brother Nu'man was asked if smoking is makruh or haram. He said, I'm not qualified to speak. I will not speak about this. Because I don't have any, I'm not a faqih. And you call him Shaykh Allama. That means someone who, according to his own statements, is not qualified. You make him Shaykh Allama, so now we all have the right to speak. Huh? So you trapped your own self. Tayyip. So here are the issues. They are not in order of importance. They're somewhat random. The first one is, the title of it is, and now I want you to remember the titles. Please remember the titles, I may ask you. Remember the titles because with these titles, we are putting the puzzle to see the picture. Again, my issue is with the overall message that is being delivered to the people, not with a single mistake. But how do you know what, what version of Islam is being uh, relate to the people with these pieces of the puzzle that I will share with you. So the first piece of the puzzle is Tawheed is not a priority. In one of his lectures, someone asked him, what is your opinion about the Prophet's birthday? Al-Mawlid, right? And we have given a lecture for those who are interested. The title of the lecture is, can I celebrate this? And we discussed all of the ayat, including Al-Mawlid al-Nabawi. He said, may Allah... Uh, forgive us and forgive him. I say I do not have an opinion about the Prophet's birthday. That is not an issue. The issue is our children are doing drugs. The, uh, the issue is our kids are leaving Islam. He goes on to say, what is wrong with you? You know, you're tripping, you're, you're focused. You're freaking out over Mawlid al Nabawi. What is wrong with you? We need to kill these issues. I was like, ouch. Subhanallah. Subhanallah, ya akhi, ya Nu'man. Ya Nu'man. What does every khatib say every khutbah? 
Huh? What do we say in the, in the khutbah? إن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يعني look at the conflict the celebration of the birthday is an innovation it's an innovation no one can dispute that unless they're following some sort of desires okay and let's say that you follow the position that it is not an innovation then there should be another response not to say it's not an issue innovations huh every muhdatha every newly invented manner is an innovation every innovation will lead astray and whatever is astray is in the fire so when we look at the issue of bid'ah and we say it's not an issue the issue is our youth are doing drugs leaving islam why are they leaving islam because of bid'ah we did not address the core why do people leave islam because they never understood islam they never truly understood the only way a person leaves iman after having found it is if they never understood islam properly so what leads the people astray? Innovations. What has led this ummah astray today? What made the people worship dead people in their graves? What made them have adriha uh, huh? in, in the masajid? What made them uh, over magnify the Prophet ﷺ given the status of Allah? What made them do this? When everything you see, every calamity is because of what? Bid'ah. It's because of a bid'ah. So we see here, the Prophet ﷺ, how long did he give da'wah when he went to Quraysh? Did the Quraysh drink alcohol? Did they do drugs? Yes, how do you know? <laughs> we don't know about drugs, right? <laughs> anyway, exactly, we don't know about drugs. Allah alam what type of drugs existed. Did they have fornication? Did they, have, they had all types of issues. Did the Prophet ﷺ deal with those in the beginning or did he just give da'wah to Tawheed for 13 years? 13 years? Trying to connect the people with Allah Azza wa Jal. How long did it take before Allah revealed the prohibition of khamr? Allah could have revealed it from day one. That khamr, intoxicants, is haram. It, uh, towards the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, khamr became officially forbidden. Why? Because there was the tawheed first. Huh? The tawheed being instilled. The aqeedah being instilled. When you become ready, then you can leave this fi sabilillah. How are you going to reverse it? How we say ignore these topics? Let's make sure that they don't leave us, they don't do drugs, they don't do intoxicants. When the Prophet's way was exactly the opposite. The opposite. When the Prophet sent Mu'ad ibn Jabal huh, to the Christians and the Jews and the Christians, Ahlul Kitab, did he tell them that the first thing you do is tell them to stop fornicating and doing drugs? Or let the first thing you do is what? Call them to La ilaha illallah. If they obey you, then let them know about salah. If they obey you, then zakah, then so on and so forth. The five pillars of Islam. When Jibreel taught the Prophet ﷺ Islam, the first thing he began with was what? The importance of La ilaha illallah, which has conditions. So if you ever try to reverse this methodology, the da'wah will eventually fail. You'll have people who go through Iman rush. Iman rush. It, it goes up and then if there's no foundation, it will eventually go down, way down. If you build a foundation that is sound, then we all go through the rise and, uh, rise and fall of Iman. Each one of us has rise and fall of Iman. But the foundation is what is fixed. No foundation, you can go very high and then go very low until you leave altogether. Of course, we understand further you know, that the, in da'wah, why shirk is, is so dangerous. And shirk is the worst sin ever. All this why Allah says, Inna Allah la yaghfiru ay yushraka biha. Allah does not forgive that shirk is associated with him. Notice, if you commit zina wal iyadu billah, we seek Allah's refuge, Allah might forgive you. If you drink alcohol, Allah might forgive you. If you kill a human being, which is a disaster, Allah might forgive you. All of these fall under the maghfir of Allah. But you die with shirk, done. Is there any... Ambiguity about what is important when we begin the da'wah. Children are leaving Islam. Don't talk about maulid. Don't talk about where's Allah because that's the next topic. huh? Don't talk about where's Allah. Don't talk about these matters of aqidah. Leave them alone. Let the people come to Allah. How are they going to come to Allah without aqidah? What is iman anyways? There's a conflict in the message. 
There's a conflict in the message that must be rectified. He says, Aqidah is complex. He says in the same video, what the Qur'an made priority is priority for us. What the Qur'an did not make a priority is not a priority for us. Then he went on to say, did Allah make a big deal out of the question where Allah is? I ask you. Even though I, I don't like that choice of words, did Allah make a big deal? Did Allah highlight the importance? That is the proper way of when we speak about Allah Azza wa Jal. Even if we're speaking to Western American crowd, you know, who speak the slang, when it comes to the deen, you know, I might say tripping and everything in, the, in a context. But when I speak about Allah Azza wa Jal, I'm not going to say make a big deal out of. I would say, did Allah highlight the importance? Like Ibrahim, you say, وَإِذَا مَرِضْتُ فَهُوْ يَشْفِينُ When I become sick, Allah is the one who cures me. He didn't say when Allah makes me sick, Allah cures me. Even though Allah Azza wa, Azza wa Jal is the one who made us all sick, and He's the one who grants shifa, but you don't attribute that to Allah Jalla Jalalu. So did Allah make a big deal? Did Allah highlight the importance of where Allah is? He says. Then he says, did Allah, uh, he said, uh, people ask, where is Allah? Is he up in the seventh heaven or is he everywhere? Did Allah ask that question? He said, I'm quoting him still. Did Allah ask that question? Did the Sahaba ask that question? Did they repeatedly ask that question? He corrected himself because I guess he remembered while he was speaking to the people that the Sahaba did speak about this. So he said, did they repeatedly huh, ask that question? He said, no, our priority should be the Qur'an's priorities. What Allah repeats the most. Huh? Not the issues which will make none of you a better Muslim. Knowing where Allah is will not make you a better Muslim. He said, we love to complicate things. No need to study the complex matter of Aqidah. He then uses the jinn as an evidence, meaning the jinn heard the Qur'an. They went and gave da'wah right away. You don't need to you know, complicate things. The answer is, did Allah highlight the importance of where Allah is? Yes or no? How frequently? All over the Qur'an. All over the Qur'an in five different ways in the Qur'an. How many times did Allah says, Allah Azza wa Jal speak about نَزَّلْنَا alayk, نَزَّلْنَا, نَزَّلْنَا, نَزَّلْنَا Sending down, sending down, sending down. And if you're not above, you don't send anything down. How many times did Allah speak about تَعْرُجُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ إِلَيْهِ يَصْعَدُ الْكَلِيمُ الطَّيِّبِ How many Allah speaks about things going up? الإسراء المعراج Where did the Prophet ﷺ go in Isra and Mi'raj? The ascension is to where? To the heavens where he spoke to Allah Azza wa Jal. How many times did Allah mention that he is above the throne? Seven times, ya akhi, subhanallah, how could you not know the Qur'an and not know this? Seven times Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned al-istiwa ala al-arsh. Is that not important enough to be said, even though is there a difference between thumma istawa ala al-arsh or ar-rahmanu ala al-arsh istawa? No, it's the same message. Why would it be repeated seven times? Once would have been enough in our own logic, as per our, but Allah seven times mentioned that. Allah mentioned him being above. I mean to man sama. Do you feel secure? He who is in the heavens, who is above the heavens. And he is the irresistible over his slaves. The angels fear Allah. Who is above them? This is all from the Quran. Then he said, Did Allah ask the question, Where is Allah? And the, 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 it's weird. Do you need that question? Does Allah have to ask us in the Quran, Do I know everything for you to know that Wallahu bi kulli shayin alim? Does Allah have to ask us, Do I know everything? Or is it sufficient for Allah to say, Wallahu bi kulli shayin alim for us to know that Allah knows everything? Allah knows everything. He doesn't have to ask us. If He told you that He is above without asking you, Where am I? It does the job. So to try to choose words that you want the Quran to say exactly that, so that it makes sense, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't have to be this way. Allah doesn't have to ask us this question. Did the Sahaba ask this question or did the Prophet ﷺ make a big deal out of it? All of you know the hadith of Sahih Muslim and you, I refer you to the lecture, Where's Allah? About the hadith of Muawiyah and the slave girl. And this is very important. I will summarize it as much as possible. So the hadith mentions that Muawiyah had a slave girl. Back then, the slaves were owned. They were like a property. Okay? They didn't have any freedom in the sense. And she was also the shepherd. She was out with the sheep in the farm or whatever that was. And one time, uh, 
a wolf came and he took one of the sheep. She didn't do her job perfectly. She had some shortcoming. When she told Muawiyah that one of the sheep were taken, he became angry and he slapped her. But of course he did what? He felt guilty. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ and told him, Ya Messenger, oh Messenger of Allah, I'm a man like other men, I became angry. And he told him the story. Upon which the Prophet ﷺ told him what? Bring her to me. He said, shall I emancipate her? Shall I set her free? He said, bring her to me first. Before you set her free, bring her to me. This is one of the most amazing hadith in the deen. She was brought to the Prophet ﷺ who asked her only two questions. Two questions. And those questions are equal to La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The declaration of faith What were the two questions? What were the first question? Ayn Allah Where is Allah? Did Allah make a big deal? Did Allah highlight the importance of this? For sure The messenger of Allah ya Shaykh The messenger of Allah himself Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Asking a slave girl Who didn't attend Medina University Nor Azhar Nor Umm Al-Qura Nowhere She wasn't a alima She was a slave girl Out Out On the fitrah And on the On the teachings Which were prevalent Among the sahaba And the question was Where is Allah? And she pointed There are many hadith And many riwayat She pointed To the heavens She said Fis sama. Allah is in the state of transcendence. Allah is above. Qala man ana? Who am I? Qalat anta Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, a'tiqha fa innaha mu'mina. She said, you are the Messenger of Allah. He said, set her free. She's a believer. Subhanallah. Two things. Two things were, were said that declared her as a believer. No further investigation. But that equals the shahada, which through which you enter Islam. That shows you how important aqidah is. And how important our belief in Allah's names and attributes is. Because the mushrikeen had shirk in rububiyyah. The mushrikeen had shirk in uluhiyyah. And the mushrikeen had shirk in asma' and sifat. The Jews, do the Jews read, do all the Jews believe that Uzair is the son of Allah? No. It, was there shirk in rububiyyah necessarily? No. Their main shirk was what? In Asma and Sifat. The shirk of the Jews. Qalu yadullahi maghlula. The hand of Allah is tight. Inna Allah faqeerun. Wa nahnu aghniya. Allah is poor. And we are rich. And in the Torah, the, you know, God didn't know where Adam was. He was looking for him in paradise. God got tired. Allah Azza wa got tired after, you know, creating the heavens and the earth. So he rested on the seventh day. This was the issue of the Jews. This was shirk in Asma and Sifat. That shows you how important that where Allah is, you knowing that is equal to la ilaha illallah. For any human being on this planet to come after the messenger of Allah and get this topic and try to put it down, we say, ya akhi, you're dead wrong, barakallahu feek. Wallahi, you're dead wrong. So the amana of the da'wah, the amana of the da'wah, when you face the people and the, either you're ignorant, if you're ignorant, then why are you speaking? Or you know, how can you deceive? And we don't assume he's deceiving anyone. We give him the best of assumption that he's not deceiving anyone. But how could that error be so grave? When you know the hadith and you know the ayat more than us, the expert of the Quran, more than us, how could you ignore this ample evidence about the importance of where Allah is and say, these issues, we need to kill them. This is not an issue. This aqidah is creating problems in the ummah. The slave girl didn't feel this way, nor did the Messenger of Allah He could have told her, huh? A ilahum ma'allah. Is this in the Quran, Ya Shu'aib? He could have asked, A ilahum ma'allah, Surah Al Nahl? Hey, more than once. Naam, Naam, Naam. A ilahum ma'allah. How many times did Allah ask? Then Allah would respond, Azza wa Jal. He could have asked her, A ilahum ma'allah. She said, La ilaha illallah. Man ana anta Rasulullah. A'tika fa ana mu'mina. He asked her where Allah is. Wonder, and this is why we are worried. Those unintentional, subliminal messages are deadly to the ummah, deadly to the people. Where aqidah is being undermined, so you think you will be able to survive in this dunya without aqidah? No way. No way we'll be able to survive. Taib. Just to affirm, of course, Imam al-Zahabi 
thought this was an important topic as well. And he compiled a book called al ulul Al-Aziz Al-Ghaffar. The transcendence of Allah, the Almighty, the most forgiving. And he quoted all the statements of the Sahaba and the Salaf, the four Imams and so on and so forth about the belief that Allah Azza wa is above. So they thought it was important. Uh, Imam Tirmidhi said he heard from Al Muzani saying, The Tawheed of a person is not valid, is not sound until he knows that Allah the Exalted is over his throne with his attributes. I said to him, like what? He said, hearing, seeing, knowing. Your iman will not be sound. Your tawheed is not sound until you believe that Allah Azza wa Jal is above the creation. This is something that Allah put in you, in your fitrah. Natural disposition. Now people who hear fitrah, they think of zakat al-fitr. Huh? Zakat al-fitr and fitrah are two different things. The fitrah is the natural disposition. Ma fi mushkila. It's the natural disposition. That's why any person on earth, when he wants to call on even if then that's not Allah, they go like this. No one ever goes like this. Oh God, help me. It doesn't, wallahi, it doesn't work. Get the biggest kafir in the world. He would look up. It's, it's the way we were built in. It's built in. In our system. And logically, everything that is above is superior. Even in the hierarchy, the pyramid. Huh? In any company, the structure of any company, it's always about the one who's on top. That's the big guy. It's just the way Allah made this dunya. It's a given. It's a given. Second issue, or third issue. Unprecedented call for free mixing. And this is when my heart broke. It was shattered when I saw these clips. His session with Akram Nadwi who's a Diobandi, might have left some of the Dioband, Diobandi belief, but his message, you can see it on YouTube, Allah Musta'an, may Allah forgive us and forgive him. Clear cut, not the straightforward Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And he compiled or made, a, I don't know, 50 volume books about the, sahab, the women in Islam. And our brother Nu'man Khan said, he sat with him for six days, studying with him, and he picked his brain out. And he was speaking to him about all these matters. And obviously, among the things he learned from him is the following. Now you judge, you judge. There was a woman named Fatima. This Fatima was the biggest muhadditha, among the biggest muhadditheen, a big woman, senior scholar in hadith. So much so that Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, the one who authored Fath al-Bari, one of the most extensive uh, shuruh and explanations of uh, Sahih Bukhari, he begged her frequently to come and teach him. He wanted to be her student, but she didn't want to travel from her country, so she always refused. Uh, the story, huh? this is a story he mentioned with no reference. No reference. Finally, she came for Umrah or a Hajj. And when she came for Hajj, the people said, now that you're here in this side of town, huh? you, you must give us a dars in the Masjid al-Nabawi, on, on Sahih Bukhari. And they forced her to give him this extensive course with 400 students attending, 300 men and 100 women. Now here's the craziest part. According to the story that Brother Nu'man relayed to American Muslims, who already have, are facing many issues in terms of trying to cope with the culture and Islam. You know, you see the American culture or the Western culture versus Islam is like, like this, right? It just doesn't work. In so many ways, it, there's no compatibility. So they already have to give up so many things trying to be in line with the society, trying to be easygoing, the whole, you know, the whole shebang. So, but you're saying this to them. This lady eventually gave the dars. Where did she sit? She sat at the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because back then they didn't have the wall. Where did she put the book? She put the book where the head of the Prophet ﷺ was. Where were the people? The men and the women were in front of her mixing. And if I heard him correctly, when she would get tired, she would recline on her students. She would recline on the students. In the Masjid al-Nabawi, huh? they were sitting men and women together. There's one thing to say there wasn't a partition, 
There weren't curtains, there wasn't a wall, but the Muslims maintained what Allah taught. It's one thing to say that. It's another thing to say they were what? Just, just relaxing, man. And then he says, we, are, we, we don't understand Islam. Huh? Then he started taking swipe at other speakers who make the deen difficult. Huh? We make it so difficult for the people. He says, when you read history of Islam, you're shocked. So he's discovering treasures that no one knew except Akram Nadawi. So according to these discoveries, we're all dead wrong. Including the ayat in the Quran. I guess they were not accurate either. There's no other explanation. He further supports the story with a crazier story. Or equally crazy. About Ibn Qayyim al jawziyyah Ibn Qayyim al jawziyyah had a halaqa in his masjid. His masjid was very small and the entrance was very small. He said men and women used to enter simultaneously. So they would all be crammed up at the door together. And they, they were forced to mix inside the masjid too because there was no space. And when they would be outside, the men would mingle with the women. Then he said, a person came to Ibn Qayyim and said, this is fitna. Huh? Look at the undermining of the other message. This is fitna, which is what we say today. Supposedly Ibn Qayyim said, the fitna of them mingling with men is less evil than having ignorant Muslim women at home. Here's what Ibn Qayyim actually says. That's what is attributed to Ibn Qayyim. Now, this, these stories, where are they from? No one knows. I went out of my way speaking to historians and scholars who have the largest collections of books, history books in Islam. I said, Ya Shaykh, such and such and such and such. What is this? He said, Hadha batil. He said, this is falsehood. Where's the reference for the story, ya akhi? Where is the reference to say this to the two, to so casually convey this to the Muslims? Where now, you're already free mixing for the sake of Allah. What else do you want? Why? Ibn Qayyim actually says, وَلَا رَيْبَ أَنَّ تَمْكِينَ النِّسَاءِ مِنْ إِخْتِلَاطِهِنَّ بِالرِّجَالِ أَصْلُ كُلُّ بَلِيَّةٍ وَشَرْ There's no doubt. This is what Ibn Qayyim says. Because now, according to this, Ibn Qayyim was a, a munafiq. If you read what he says, if you hear what he says and what he did, he will say these don't add up. He said there's no doubt that allowing women to mix with men is the root of every calamity and evil. And it's among the main reasons why Allah sends comprehensive calamities, something that overtakes the whole nation. And it's also among the reasons why there's corruption among the general people and the people internally. And this is among And it's among the reasons why death spreads and all types of epidemics, medical problems, you know, diseases spread among the people, plagues spread among the people. He says, and when the, the prostitutes of, of at the time of Musa alayhi salam, the prostitutes of Bani Israel, when they started mixing with the people and fahisha, you know, corruption and, and, and uh, promiscuity spread among the people, he said, Allah sent a disease upon them. واحد, ما, فمات في يوم واحد 70,000 died in one day because of this. He said, This is a very famous story in the Kutub of Tafsir. So Ibn Qayyim is telling us that the men in mixing with women is the source of every calamity. And then we say to the people, Ibn Qayyim had men and women sitting in this masjid, in this halaqa, and they were mixing outside. He said, Ma fi mushkila, this is better than the other one. What is the reference, ya akhi? What does Allah say in the Quran, more importantly? Allah says to the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu and the Sahaba, are these the purest people we ever knew after the Prophet? For sure. وَإِذَا سَأَلْتُمُوهُنَّ فَاسْأَلُوهُنَّ مِنْ وَرَاءِ حِجَابِ ذَلِكَ أَطْهَرُ لِقُلُوبِكُمْ وَقُلُوبِهِنْ Subhanallah, if you ask them, this is the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. And any woman who's married to the Prophet ﷺ, would she even ever bother look at any man afterwards? Seriously? The Messenger of Allah ﷺ, that's, that's the biggest prize a, a woman can get. That's the Messenger of Allah. So she, already there's no interest and they are أَطْهَر, they are even purer than that. Hey, now, Jazakallah khair. Mata'an, if you ask them for anything, Ahsanti, Hafdur Rahman. So they are, the women, the wives of the Prophet are already pure. The Sahaba, do you think any one of them would harm the wife of the Prophet ﷺ? No. So this is a, and what is the ayah says, as you meant, Mata'an, if you ask him for anything, then ask him from behind the partition. Why? This is purer for your heart and for their hearts. 
If the purest of hearts, Allah is telling them, still have a partition for you to have purity, then what do we say about ourselves today? What do we say? And it's because of this methodology that we see our brother Nu'man Khan co-lecturing with a woman. He's sitting here, and the sister's sitting here. And they're addressing the same crowd. Can you imagine? And when you read his, you listen to his tafsir about Tell the believing men to lower their gaze. You say, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, beautiful tafsir. Then you look at the brother looking at the sisters. We assume he's looking in the background. I will give him the benefit of the doubt. Even though it appears to us that he's looking at them, he's actually just looking at the background. But does everyone understand that? Does everyone understand that? No, they don't. So what is the message we're given? Men and women co-lecturing together. Huh? Having a, and the sister, it's not like she was wearing, you know, the niqab, and, so, you know, wearing the typical American pink hijab with the, with the makeup and the eyebrows that are perfectly, and the whole thing, the whole thing. Say, this is the sister giving da'wah to the brothers. So when, and this is the feedback I've got from regular people, they're saying, I'm confused. So you were telling us that we're, you know, you're extreme then. This whole time the deen is much simpler than you're making it. So the problem is with you other du'at who are pro-segregation. It should have been easy. If they were doing it at the time of the Prophet, at the time of Ibn Hajar, and the time of Ibn Qayyim, huh? and you know, this brother who knows the Qur'an, he knows what the ayah means, Kul mu'minina min absarim. he knows what it means, he doesn't have a problem, what's your problem? You see? It becomes difficult to explain to the people that you need to understand this as per the way of the righteous predecessors. Is this how they understood it? La wallah. We don't deny, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there were no second floor. Huh? There wasn't a second floor, there wasn't a curtain. But they were what? They were etiquettes. They were etiquettes. Men were in the back, men were in the front, women in the back. And what did the Prophet ﷺ say? The worst rows for the women are the front ones. And the worst rows for the men are the back ones. Why? This is the closest proximity in the masjid. The worst. How about when they are next to each other? Is that bad? It's pretty bad. Fourthly, belittling scholars and mufassireen. And this is something that he must have learned from Yasir. Yasir Qadi and others. Because I, again, he is influenced by the people that he associates with, unfortunately. They have affected him without a doubt. And when someone says, uh, Umar will fail in a aqidah quiz that you give him, then belittling someone other than the Sahaba is not, is not a big deal. So what does he say? He said that some Islamic organizations, they take advantage. Ouch. He says it is to take advantage of them because they do not have minimal education of this religion. Some organizations take advantage of the Muslims who don't have enough knowledge. So it's easy to take them for a ride. I'm quoting him. He said, we need to teach the people, people based on proper studies. Beautiful, we agree. We reserve, he, then he says, we reserve the right to agree with our scholars of classical tafsir, and we also reserve the right to disagree with our classical scholars. Fine. Even though that statement could have been made a little more uh, uh, eloquent in a sense that we don't wind up looking down at the mufassirin. Huh? That's not the problem. He goes on to say that in Surah Al-Kahf, he gives an example to the people. In Surah Al-Kahf, the, the, the Shabab, huh? the youngsters who were in the cave, they had a dog with them, right? وَكَلْبُهُمْ بَاسِطٌ ذِرَعَيْهِ بِالْوَصِيدِ He says, <laughs> he said, some of our Mufassireen, they hated dogs so much, that they refused to believe that it is actually speaking about a dog. These Mufassireen are, no way Allah is going to mention a dog. Dogs are bad, so this ayah is not referring to a dog, it's referring to a servant. Then he says, then the, show, the comedy show begins of course, clowning the Mufassir. And he said, speaking of Mufassirin, this Mufassir said this, he said this, an fulan, an fulan, mentioning different opinions of the scholars who are entitled to their tafsir. Then he said, and this is the part that scared me very much, and this is why 
if you, if you don't know the Arabic language, you can easily be mis misled. He said in refuting the scholar who had a problem with the fact that it's a dog, he said, but the ayah says that the dog, his paws, his paws, the paws of the dog are stretched out. But the ayah says, وَكَلْبُهُمْ بَاسِطٌ ذِرَاعَيْهِ Look in any classical book of Arabic language and find a single one which says that dhira stands for the paws of a dog. You will find zero. So he's telling the people mistakenly that, the, that this Mufassir is so crazy. huh? He insists that it's not a dog even though the ayah is clear. It says the paws of the dog are stretched out. And the ayah says dhira'ay. And you must have heard this from other huh? Sab'una dhira'an, dhira'an, dhira'an. When it's speaking about a dog, it stands for the four legs. The four legs of a dog. Never in the history of language did it stand for paws. The paws of the dog, P-A-W. So how can we say to the people that the ayah was so clear, speaking about a dog, and the mufassir was so stubborn, he doesn't want to accept the dog. When the ayah did not actually say that. So it's a mistake, but... It's a grave mistake because it is saying about the Qur'an what it didn't say. And then what is the lesson you learn from this? Is that these scholars are so silly. Wasting their time saying the dog was uh, this type of dog, this color of dog, this wasn't really a dog. This, they went out of their way dedicating their life to write this tafsir. And then we come, you know, some hun hundreds of years later to say, this guy, man. He's just insisting that it's not a dog when it clearly says it's a dog. And you know, he says we have the right to disagree with that. We just disagree with that. We say this is not the way of our scholars. The way of our scholars is they show the utmost respect to the people of ilm. Allah will raise those who have been given knowledge in degrees. We never ever belittle them in this fashion, even when we want to disagree with them. We don't make their effort go to waste and we figured it out and they couldn't figure it out because the ayah was so clear. This also led to the belittlement of the companions and knowledge. He said, the people of the cave, you do not, he says, you, do not read, you, you don't need real knowledge or that's what the, the message is actually. So I will not misquote him. He says that these, the people of the cave are standards for us at the time of fitna. He said, they never said a single prophet's name. They never quoted a book. They never gave a dalil from an ayah. They do not have any ijazah. These are the, the Ashabul Kaf, huh? Ashabul Kaf. They are not ulama. They are not fuqaha. They are not mufassirin. They are nothing. All they say, I don't think we should worship idols. I think we should worship one God. Simple. They know nothing. He continues, they knew nothing. So now, what is the message you understand? That the people of the cave, Allah was pleased with them, He made them heroes, He mentioned them in the Quran, even though they had absolutely no knowledge. But do we actually know that they had no knowledge? Does the Quran have to explain to us what type of knowledge they had or what type of knowledge they didn't have? The fact that Allah wanted in Surah Al-Kahf to highlight the reason behind their Success was Tawheed, Tawheed, ha, highlighting the Aqeedah. Because Allah highlighted, can we speak on behalf of Allah and say that they didn't know anything else? They didn't have any book, they didn't know any prophet's name, they didn't quote any hadith, they didn't quote any ayah from the Quran, nothing. They didn't quote anything, yet they are heroes. He said, these are the standards for us at the time of fitna. Basically, all you have to do is, I don't think we should worship idols. I think we should worship one God. Khalas, you're good to go, my brother. You're good to go, my sister. That is oversimplification of the deen. An oversimplification of knowledge. Subhanallah. How many conditions of la ilaha illallah do we know? Why would Allah say to the Prophet ﷺ, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ No! That there's, who knew la ilaha illallah more than the Messenger of Allah? No one. Yet Allah told him, no. Learn. There's a lot more to la ilaha illallah Allah than merely just saying that. They are... There are conditions that have to be met. This is besides the sunnah. Besides the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in trying to support that in another lecture, 
he said to prove the point that we are too critical and too complicated, we're complicating things. He said, Bilal did not know how to pronounce the letter Sheen. Bilal, you know Bilal radiallahu anhu arda? According to this fabricated story, in case you didn't know, it's fabricated. This cannot be attributed to Bilal. According to this fabricated story, again, no authenticity of what is being related to the Muslims. Bilal did not know how to pronounce the letter Sheen. So every time he would call the Adhan, he would say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. He said, yet, the Prophet ﷺ loved it. He didn't. He said, today, if a, a Mu'adhin were to say, Ashadu Allah, we say, sit down. This Adhan is, is unacceptable. huh? Repeat, the Adhan is unacceptable. But the Messenger of Allah ﷺ had no problem with Bilal not being able to pronounce the Sheen. And the news is, there's no such story that is authentic. That Bilal did not know how to pronounce the Sheen. Secondly, is this something you mention? Do we want to mention something about the Sahabi, which from, from this moment onwards, every time you think of Bilal, what are you going to think about that defect? You will not think about uh, the Prophet ﷺ heard his steps in Jannah and asked him why. He said that I prayed to Rakaat. You will not remember that. What will stick in your brain? The defect. Because the shaitan will utilize it against us. This is why our methodology is never mention anything bad about the Sahaba. Never. Even the differences that happen among them, don't highlight them. The differences that happen afterwards with Muawiyah, don't highlight them. Why? Because there's a poison that comes from the Shia. The poison of undermining the Sahaba. When you start undermining the Sahaba, you can kiss your religion goodbye. You can kiss it goodbye. You, can start, you start thinking, well, if they did it, I do it, then no problem. Oversimplification, it doesn't work this way. Even worse than this story, he mentioned another story. He said that when the Sahaba, when people started entering into Islam, some Sahabi was teaching a young boy the Quran. So when he's teaching him the ayah, Mushrikeen, he said that he, the Sahabi huh, was telling the boy Mushrikeen, and the boy would say, What was the word that he said? Hey, Musriqeen. He will tell, Yarhamuk Allah. He said, the Sahabi would tell him Mushrikeen, and the boy would say, Musriqeen. He said, Mushrikeen, 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 Mushrikeen. He said, Ya Akhi, just say Fujjar. The Sahabi told him, change the ayah. If you cannot pronounce Mushrikeen, just say Fujjar. Because Mushrikeen and Fujjar are, at some times, synonymous terms. Can you believe in your right mind that the Sahabi is going to tell a person to change an ayah because he cannot pronounce Mushrikeen? How can you relay the story, Ya Akhi, to the people? They, what, what is the message that you get at the end? It's, it's really, it's, it's unbelievable. And the problem is there's no... See, this is why the methodology of the righteous predecessors. This is why verification is important. Authenticity is important. Taking the information from the reliable scholars is important. When you just quote everything that you read or everything you learn from Akram Nadawi or, or whoever you wind up sitting with, then obviously disasters are going to overtake the ummah. This is a very serious matter. To say that the Sahabi told the boy, don't say Mushrikin, say Fujjar. Tahrif, this is Tahrif li kalam Allah Azza wa Jal. And this story is being told to the people to let them feel relaxed. He said, you know, you try to teach the person Fatiha and you keep correcting him. Take it easy, Akhi. So then the person feels, oh, even the Fatiha, I can take my sweet time to learn the Fatiha and I can take my sweet time to learn this and I can take my sweet time. And then you, you never adhere to the religion. And this is the package. The package is Islam like the Sufis. How did the Sufis want to grab people? They made like this flowerly Islam. Huh? They made this kind of beauty, beautified, beautified uh, version of Islam to make it attractive to the people. Just like who? Paul with the Christians. Huh? The Paul one. How did he bring the, the non-Jews to Christianity? How did he do it? He changed the teachings of Jesus. When Jesus spoke about circumcision, Paul said it's the circumcision of the heart. Anything that Jesus highlighted, Paul would what? He would change it so that he can attract followers. Christmas, huh? The Jews in that time was in accordance with other celebrations among the pagans. The Gentiles. How do you bring them? We choose the same day. Okay, they celebrate this. Yalla ya Sheikh, come up with the birthday of Jesus. Yalla, ma fi But he wasn't born on the 25th of December. Ya Sheikh, ma shihalak. When we celebrate on the same day, we'll bring this to Christianity. That's exactly what Paul did, and he, su he succeeded. Huh? Christians now follow who? Jesus or Paul? Paul. The whole religion is Paul. And the Sufis tried to do the same thing. That's how fabricated narration spread. Oh, Surah Yasin. 
The people are not reading the Quran enough. Let us come up with some beautiful ahadith. Surah Yaseen, the heart of the Quran. If you recite Surah Yaseen upon this, then you will get this. And when the, the fabricator was asked, Ya Akhi, fear Allah, how could you attribute to the Messenger of Allah? I didn't say. He said, I saw the people were staying away from the book of Allah. Hajaru huh? kitab Allah. They abandoned the book of Allah. I said, I'll bring it back. Ya Allah, I've come up with some narrations. So people, now all Muslims have memorized Surah Yaseen. But it's based on what? Fabrications. So that Sufi version of Islam, where you try to beautify, beautify, put some flowers and roses and nice decorations. Hey, akhi, look how beautiful Islam is. Islam is a beautiful religion. The whole, that's the message you always hear. It's a beautiful religion. We don't doubt it's a beautiful religion as is. As Allah revealed it. When Allah revealed, Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum, that's beautiful. But to change all these things and say it's beautiful, that's ugly. It's ugly. You cannot change it like this. Anyways, next, <laughs> the worst oversimplification, and this is the, as they say, the straw that broke the camel's back. That famous clip about Aqidah. Aqidah is not important. You all heard? How many have seen the clip? MashaAllah. So in short, he was giving a lecture in Kuwait, and after they prevented him from speaking to the people, he went outside in the street. A sister came to him with a book in her hand. Allahu alam what book it is. Kitab al-Tawheed, al-Usul al-Thalatha, al-Aqid al wasitiyah No one knows. And she said, you need to teach this to the people. And of course, may Allah forgive us and forgive him. He didn't take it very well. Huh? And he was uh, very sarcastic. Very sarcastic. Uh, and the book had, you know, three categories. Uh, he mentioned it has three categories of Tawheed. Huh? Rububiyya, Uluhiyya, Asma' and Sifat. She said, you need to teach this to the people so they will know Tawheed and protect them from shirk. So he says, is this Quran? Is this Quran? Uh, no. Obviously, it's not the Quran. But that means that only the Quran? M mind you now. Many have been hinting that he, you know, he, he might be among the reject rejectors of hadith. He explained himself that he's not. And we assume that he's not. But notice something. Rejectors of hadith don't necessarily have to tell you we reject the hadith altogether. In fact, rejectors of hadith will quote a hadith to support the rejection. They will use a hadith to tell you why they don't believe in hadith. So they have some attachment to hadith. Rejection doesn't have to be wholesome. Doesn't have to be at, at you know, the whole overall. It could be the rejection of certain notions of the hadith. So now, huh? any other, is this Quran? No. Is this a surah? No. He said, this is pretty complicated. I'm trying to study Islam. I'm scared right now. I feel I might be a mushrik. He says that he doesn't know that stuff. He said, I don't know this stuff. She said, you don't want to learn? He said, I don't want to learn it either. He said, the word aqidah is not in the Quran. The Prophet taught iman and not aqidah. Wow. Now, I would say in... In, in, in the condition he was in, maybe, you know, again, when a speaker is addressing a large crowd, it becomes difficult to discipline oneself, okay? If, if you're engaging the people and you feel their uh, tentative hearing, they're engaging with you, they're listening, then you go into a particular zone where you may lose control. It happens to every day. We assume that this is one of these mishaps. We assume the brother should not believe what he said. We hope, inshallah, because it's impossible to believe this. And then give da'wah to the Qur'an, which we are calling the people to. It's impossible. This oversimplification of uh, uh, the books that were authored about Aqidah, claiming that this is not Qur'an, not Surah. Now, when he made this video, he was refuted by a number of speakers, a number of students of knowledge, some of them who are graduates from Medina University, they have their degrees, they have their ijazat, they are not, they're, they're not light weights, huh? heavyweights in da'wah. I don't want to mention their names. He wrote a clarification which he posted on his Facebook that didn't, didn't address the matter. It was more like, is it, if I say to you, white people are mean. White people are mean. And you say, whoa! Uh, how can you say that? What is your evidence that white people are mean? I say, well, let me tell you my story. I used to hang out with, you know, uh, you know the, the African people, and the white people always used to, you know, pick on us and, and, and treat us in a, in a racial manner. 
I also hang out with Mexicans and the white people are also treating us in a racial manner. I hang out with the Indians and we got the same treatment. So based on my experience with all these people, white people are mean. And we say that's, that's beautiful, but that's your story. That is your experience in life. And you cannot use this to say that white people are mean. Because many other people met other white people who weren't mean. So when the issue was raised, he mentioned his story, his suffering, what he went through. Huh? The, the problems he faced and that led them to the Quran. And as a result, he justified the, his statements. He apologized for offending anyone, but didn't apologize for the actual mistake. He simply said, sorry if I offended you, but this is what I have gone through. Therefore, this is my justification. We say that is your personal experience, my brother Nurman, but that doesn't make it right. It does not make it right. What, what, you, what other people have gone through a similar story. But aqidah, learning the asma and sifat is what made them return to Allah. Type, what is the difference between your story and, and theirs? Their personal experience and theirs. And the part that bothered me the most, which we assume is another mishap, is that in his clarification in the post, huh, he said that he actually was with the Salafis, right? He was with the Salafis, he was with them, he said, I learned everything. Huh? He learned everything, he was able to refute, he started having the same mentality of criticizing others. But when the sister asked him, what did he say to her? I don't know this stuff. This is complicated stuff. I'm afraid I'm a mushrik now. I don't want to learn it. So which one is it? Is it when you were mocking the sister that you actually didn't know? You knew but you said you didn't know? Or when you wrote the clarification, it turns out that you, mashallah, know more than we thought. So again, you know, these are signs that this is not, it's not an, a safe approach to the matter. Undermining aqidah is, is the most disastrous thing you can do in your life. Listen to Jundub ibn Abdullah. He said, we were youths around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. We first learned iman and then we learned the Quran. And the Qur'an increased our Iman. The first thing what they learned was what? Iman. Iman falls under Aqidah. Aqidah is broader than Iman. Because Aqidah is from, like Aqattum Iman, it's that what you firmly believe in. Uqda, not. Not. Meaning you have Iman and it's firm. It's unshakable. Huh? That's what Aqidah is. So everything you believe about Allah's angels, the, the, the Prophet ﷺ, all of this falls under what? Your i'tiqad. What you believe, what you have creed, a strong creed about. The Sahaba learned Iman and then they learned Quran. And when the brother was approached, huh, said, is this Quran? Because what the book of Aqidah, what is it going to teach you? What your Iman is. What do you believe as a Muslim? What do you believe? If I told you, La ilaha illallah, and I didn't warn you, that if you prostrate to an idol, you will leave Islam. Have I taught you la ilaha illallah? No. What did Allah say to the Prophet Allah said to the Prophet والسلام, The Prophet, if you commit shirk, your deeds will be nullified and you will be among the losers. Who did Allah say this to? The Prophet والسلام, To highlight what? How important and dangerous is what? Shirk, Luqman, inna shirka. So when you have any book that is highlighting shirk, so you can be warned against it, and we know shirk is prevalent in our countries, right? How can you say, put this aside, Quran is enough. The Quran is enough when the Sahaba learned Iman first, then they learned the Quran. First the Prophet ﷺ taught them what to believe about Allah Azza wa Jalla. That's why the slave girl, even though she wasn't a hafidh of the Quran as far as we know, she had the right answer. Ayn Allah, Allahu fi sama. She knew this because of the methodology of the Prophet ﷺ in teaching the Sahaba. That's why the Sahaba never differed in their aqidah. Belittling or believing in part of the book. He says, may Allah forgive us and forgive him. We, other speakers, other du'a, you see the problem is if, if the brother didn't even go out and attack us, we would also, you know, say, Yalla Allah musta'an. But in the process of the recent da'wah, others are being attacked. Meaning anyone who disagrees with the, what he's teaching now, we have become the scary extremist fundamentalist, you know, radicals, whatever you want to call us. 
This is the message that you get. That if anyone tells you other than that simplified, oversimplified message, be careful of this person. He's complicating the deen, but Allah made it much simpler. An example of that, he says that uh, the other du'at make it seem that no one can enter Jannah. That Jannah, you, you have no chance. You, ah, come on, you, and he, he mocks. You, no way. You don't have a chance. Subhanallah al -Azim. What did the Salaf teach? In your journey to Allah, you're like what? You're like a bird. You have two wings, huh? One wing of hope and one wing of fear. Now you go in either one direction, you're done. Too much hope in Allah, not enough fear, doesn't fly. Too much fear of Allah, no hope, despairing from the words of Allah, it doesn't fly. You need both. If it was so simple, then the most deserving of this relaxed attitude would be who? The Sahaba. When you have a Sahabi whom the Messenger of Allah said, Anta min ahlil Jannah. You are from the inhabitants of Jannah. He's been maw'ud bil Jannah, promised Jannah. And like Umar. And Umar, when he knew there was a list of munafiqeen, who was he worried about? His uncle? He was worried about himself. And we hear Abu Bakr saying, if a caller called, everyone will enter paradise. Except one, I would be afraid that I will be that one. That we cannot ignore what the Sahaba said. We're not trying to say, lose hope and go into Jannah. La ya akhi. But we cannot on the flip side say to American Muslims, and it's funny because you read the comments, one sister, it's ironic by the way, the biggest support he got is from Khan. Like if you read the comments, what is Sajda Khan? Khan. It's like 99% of the Khans are like for the Khan. You know, these are, we're all Khan together. And you know, get out of here, right? It's like, you know, it's almost like a, a clan. And I'm sure he doesn't support that. But all these Khans were most upset about this whole thing. How did I get here? So the message is, we're making it difficult for the people to enter Jannah. And entering Jannah is a much, much simpler thing. And then he quotes an ayah that, you know, Sari'u, he quoted, he actually mixed two ayat. Mafi mushkila, we all make mistakes. The bottom line is, he said, huh? Alladheena amanu billahi wa rusulih. This, this Jannah is for all those who believe in Allah and His messengers. That's it. He said, the Quran simplifies it. You believe in Allah and His messengers and you're almost good to go. And we know from the way of the Sahaba, this is not the case. We have to have balance. Give people hope in Allah Azza wa Jal, in Allah's mercy, in Allah's forgiveness, and also warn the people about destruction. The first da'wah of the Prophet ﷺ, when he got, the first time when he was said, Fazda bima tu'mar, when Allah told him, then proclaim what you've been commanded. What was the first thing he said to the people when he gathered all the tribes? He said, I am a warner. And Allah called him Bashirun wa nadir. He is a giver of glad tidings and a warner. You have to have both. And when we give da'wah, we try to balance and give both. But to tell the, again, the American Muslim, one sister, that's, the, that's how I got there. One sister said, we American Muslims understand what he's saying. Ooh. So we non-American Muslims don't understand what he's saying. So there's two Islams. American Islam, uh, maybe more British Islam, Australian Islam, Saudi Arabia Islam. This kind of division of saying that you don't understand, you must live in this Los Angeles in order for you to understand what we're going through. <clears throat> Seriously? That's why the scholars don't understand. He said, the scholars don't understand. They don't know Richard Dawkins. They don't know Richard Dawkins. They don't know all these philosophies. They don't know all the things that you learn in, in school, in theology. That's why the scholars are not equipped to help you. Who's equipped to help you? We. Don't go study overseas. Study in America. Study Islam in America. Again, why? Why? Why undermine the position of the scholars, ya akhi? The ulama, you think the ulama are naive? Does he have to know Richard Dawkins to be able to dismiss any shubuhat around the aqidah? La wallah. Allah gave him nur. Allah gave him uh, basira. They know. They don't have to know the intricate. And if, if, if we agree with you on so many fronts, then it is our job to praise the scholars, convey to them what the modern world has, so that they can work to help the ummah. Not say they don't know, ignore them. We have Yasir Qadi. Yasir Qadi is a, a scholar and academic. Khalas, it's enough for you. It's enough for you. Umar would have failed the exam with Yasir Qadi. 
Yasser Qadi who speaks about Umar as if they were living with each other, Ya Shaykh, for years and we didn't know. How, do you, how can you say he would fail this exam and that exam, whether you give him from this school, he would fail grade one and grade... How can you speak about Umar like you, you and him hung out all your lives? This is from ilmul ghayb aslan, from the knowledge of the unseen. You, can, you don't have the right to speak about a sahabi in this manner, even if you were right. For me to come say, Abu Bakr wouldn't even know this, ya akhi. See, this is inappropriate with the sahaba. Inappropriate with the sahaba. La tasubbu ashabi. This is a form of belittlement. If I told you, your father, he would fail. If I give him right now, if I show him the smartphone, your father doesn't even know how to you know, start an application. It's true or not, maybe it's true or not, he still uses an old feature phone. But isn't that belittlement of someone's father? I'm not going to accept that. Okay, fine, my father doesn't know, but you don't have to tell it to me. And don't mention my father like this if you don't mind. This is, uh, the Sahaba are more beloved to us than our fathers, ya akhwan. I'm not going to have some guy come and make fun of Umar in any way, shape or form. And then take him as a, as a leader versus the scholars. All these ulama who spend their whole life studying. Now we get guys who pose with the you know, pictures. With a pen in the hand, and this is the, the representation of academia and, and knowledge. And we replace the ulama with these individuals? No, I'm sorry. This is the manhaj of the rawafid. The rejectors, those who reject the, the khilaf of Abu Bakr and Umar. And Umar from among all? Let him say this about Ali. Let him say this about Ali and deal with the Shia. You think the Shia will let it slide? Wallah, they will have him out of the country in two days. But you know, he says he befriends the Shia. But Umar, it's okay. It's okay. Umar, who, who would walk with the stick, radiallahu anhu. I would want someone to say this in his face. Umar, you would fail in Aqidah class if I gave it to you. Say it to his face. It's the audacity. And this type of da'wah, I don't care how much good is involved. Just this is enough to spoil everything. This is the, the nasty, sour flavor that will ruin all the sweetness which you may be conveying in other messages. One word, the slave says, the Prophet ﷺ, one word, he doesn't pay attention to it, it will throw him in the hellfire 70 years. We ask Allah to protect them and protect us from that. It's a very dangerous thing to take a swipe at a sahabi. To mention anything about sahabi. Same thing he mentioned about the sahabi who was looking at women from under his hormones and homie and all that. No, akhi, no. Not the Sahaba, not the Sahaba, don't ever do this. We teach our children loving and respecting the Sahaba. If we start undermining them, you have, you have nothing left in this deen. Who conveyed this deen to us anyways, except the Sahaba? In speaking about Surah Yaseen, he also mentioned that man. وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَلْ مَدِينَةِ رَجْلٌ يَسْعَ قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اتَّبِعُوا الْمُرْسَلِينَ He has a very nice explanation, no doubt. When, when I listen to the whole lecture, you know, you cannot help but be impressed by the correlation and how he gets notes from different ulama, some of which are Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, some of which are clearly not. He mentions that. And then you try to connect the people with the story. There's, this is a benef beneficial thing, no doubt. But then the little things here and there. If we just left it at that, it'll be, it'll be beautiful for the Muslims. It's a beneficial dars. It's a beneficial dars. But then when you hear something like this, he says, how this man rushed to give da'wah, even though he's unknown to us. He said, we do not know his name. He's a rajul. We don't know his address. We don't know. Again, look at why we have a problem. Now you see the difference in the, the approach, the ideology. Pay attention to the subtle words. He said, we don't know his name, that's fine. We don't know his address, yeah, Sheikh, that's fine. We don't need to know his address, no one's gonna visit him. We don't know the scholars he studied under. Hmm. Um, he studied under any, what, ijazah. We don't know of him having any ijazah, no ijazah. He simply heard about one God, and that there are messengers, and it all made sense to him, and now he's a hero in Islam. He says, the lesson we learn is that we Muslims are obsessed with credentials. And we're not, and so, so I will not misquote him. Now, if, if we were dealing with the pseudo Salafis, they would have stopped right there. But he continued to say, so we will be fair with him, and not, 
and not nearly as obsessed with sincerity. True. True. There is an element of not paying attention to sincerity, but we say both. He said both statements. But the first, the issue with the statement is we are obsessed with credentials. He said the Quran teaches the opposite. Quran teaches that no one is insignificant. Again, Kalimatu Haq. The word of truth, Urida biha batil. But with the intent behind it is, is not good. Not that he intended not, not good. The outcome, I would say, is not good. Because what are we saying to the people is, listen, ya akhi, if you, have lear- if you have just heard the message of there are messengers that exist and there's one God, khalas, now you go out and give da'wah. You don't need any ijazah. We don't need to know who you studied under. We don't need to know your name. We don't need to know your address. One man, he's a hero. Until now, we read about him in the Quran. We say you cannot measure... You cannot do the qiyas of a story Allah mentioned in the Quran so many, you know, centuries ago and apply it in this day and time after the advent of the Prophet ﷺ who gave us detailed explanation of the Quran. Surely the Quran was trying to simplify. The Quran is not going to tell you he studied under fulan and fulan. Yani we, the, the, don't, the belittlement of the people's understanding. We know the Quran is not going to go into these details. But that does not mean on the flip side that the message we learn is we're too obsessed with credentials. You don't need to have any credentials, technically. And therefore, now, you know, da'wah becomes an open platform for everybody. He says this is a sunnah, a sunnah that the, uh, of the Qur'an that is lost. Which is the sunnah of the Qur'an. Again, again, the sunnah of the Qur'an. That... No need for all these complications. Just give da'wah. But is that what the Quran says? What does the Quran also say? قُلْ هَذِي سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي Ya subhanallah. Say, this is my path. Allah telling the Prophet ﷺ, say, this is my path. I call to Allah. Huh? This is for the da'wah. عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ Upon insight, upon very specific knowledge. I and all those who follow me. أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي Whosoever follows me must follow the same path of the Prophet ﷺ calling people upon insight. Not that he's from Aqsa al-Madinah, he hears about Tawheed, he runs and now he's given the da'wah. While this could be true in some cases, is this the standard way? No, it is not. It's an exception to the rule. The standard way is that you learn. Al-ilm qabla al-qawlu wal-amal. This is why the Salaf stipulated these principles. And when you turn away from the way of the Salaf, you become like Hati Bulayl. You become like someone who's trying to chop wood and at night. Huh? He will tries to cut the tree, he chops off his brother. He chops off a cat. He can't see in front of him. When you don't follow the way of the Salaf, you, you can go a, any direction. Chopping things off, just cutting everybody up. Oh, the Sunnah of the Quran, what? Simplify things, Akhi, all these credentials, obsession over obsession. We Muslims make things complicated, stop complicating things. But the way of the Prophet ﷺ was quite different. The way of Bukhari and Muslim and Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah and Abu Dawood was quite different. The way of the Sahaba was quite different. The way of all the scholars until today has always been quite different. In continuing the story about following the messengers, he loved the part when the man said, Follow the messengers. He says, Ibrahim... Yeah, Ibrahim, he said, you know, what's the easiest thing? He said, Ibrahim taught Iman. He said, we need to learn Iman from the messengers. We need to learn Iman from the messengers. And the messengers taught Iman in the simplest way. Ibrahim simply said to the people, the sun is not my God, the moon is not my God, then huh? I have turned my face to, one, to the one who created the heavens and the earth and so on and so forth. So this is the simplicity of the message of Ibrahim. We, on the other side... Make people study aqidah, which is not necessary. So, if we're saying to the, he said, this is again a sunnah that we're not applying, which is following the way of the prophets and giving da'wah. We say, okay, if you want to do this, uh, brother Nu'man, if you want to follow this approach, let us look at how Ibrahim gave da'wah in the Quran. Ibrahim did what to the idols? Yalla ya akhi, tfaddal he, that church is in America, plenty, mashallah, tabarakallah. If we're going to say to the people, we follow the sunnah of the prophets, huh? we follow Ibrahim Hanifan, we are the ummah of Ibrahim, follow Ibrahim, go to the churches, break down their statues. And then leave the big one, huh? 
And when they ask you who did it, say, the big one. Isn't that what Ibrahim did? Alayhi salam? That's the sunnah of Ibrahim. Where is it? You say, na ya akhi. Na ya brother. You cannot take this incident and say, this is how we apply it. Say, Ex excellent. And you cannot take this story and say, this is the sun, not my God. This is the moon, not my God. This must be our God. You cannot take that story either. Why choose one story that is oversimplified and ignore the other one? Hmm? أَفَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْدِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْدِ Do you believe in part of the book and you believe in the other one? Do you want to follow the Sunnah of Ibrahim? Here's what Allah said. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ فِي إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ إِذْ قَالُوا لِقَوْمِهِمْ إِنَّ بُرَآءُ مِنْكُمْ وَمِمَّا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ كَفَرْنَا بِكُمْ وَبَدَأْ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمُ الْعَدَاوَةُ وَالْبَغْضَاءُ أَبَدًا حَتَّى تُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَحْدَهِ You have in Ibrahim and those who were with him an excellent example. We follow the Sunnah of Ibrahim. He said to his people, we are innocent from everything you're worshipping besides Allah and we disbelieve in you and enmity and hatred shall remain between us until you worship Allah alone. Go give da'wah like that. Go to the church, go to the rabbis, to their temples and say to them what Ibrahim said. You say, la ya akhi, this is not how you give da'wah, this is, as a, this is Ibrahim as a particular context. We say, yeah brother, then the same. So don't choose the, the most western applicable story of Ibrahim and ignore the others. It's not fair for the Muslims to only highlight. And when they see him in the lens of the Quran expert, huh, they will not look beyond that. They, the, the followers will not look beyond that. He knows, I don't know, he knows. So we're giving the people a mixed message. We're not giving them the full picture. This, the sunnah of the messengers is a lot more than that oversimplification. Anyways, so what is their conclusion? The conclusion is the people are rejecting any criticism against him because he to them embodies Quran. And this is that sensitivity. Because he's preaching the Quran and he's highlighting the importance of the Quran, which is appreciated, the people have reluctance huh, to speak against him, to mention anything. Why? Because they, they feel that they're indirectly taking a swipe at the Quran or they're undermining the Quran. This is, this is the element that is making many people reject any criticism of any type. But we say to them, my brothers and sisters, look at the khawarij. And we're not, claim, we're not accusing him of being a khariji wal iyadhu billah. But look at the khawarij. Do you know who killed Ali radiallahu anhu? Does anyone know his name? Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim? This guy, Umar had sent him huh, to teach the people the Quran. He sent him, he said, this guy is the sheikh. Let him teach the people the Quran and expand his house. Uh, when he sent him to... Uh, Ibn Yunus, naam, in the Tariq of Masr, he mentioned. He sent him and he said to the, the, the Amir of the Mintaqa, expand his house because this person, I want the people to be able to learn the Quran from him. He's the one who killed Ali radiallahu anhu fi sabilillah. Khariji. The people of the Khawarij, do you know their traits? What did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa say? You, when you compare your salah to their salah, you would, you would belittle yourselves. When you compare your ibadah to their ibadah, you would belittle yourselves. They yaqra'oon al-Quran, they will read the Quran, but it will not go beyond their throats. We're not saying he's of those. I'm not trying to say that. What I'm trying to say is, the fact that a person is highlighting the importance of the Quran does not mean that he is untouchable. It does not mean he's untouchable because we have examples from history where people who were very attached to the Quran, like the Khawarij, are the ones who killed the Sahaba using the Quran. The evidences they had to support their ideology was the book of Allah Azza wa Jal. The book of Allah according to the understanding of who? The Sahaba? No. According to their understanding. So when you understand the Quran in a way other than the Sahaba, you will go astray and you will lead the people astray. So we say to Brother Nu'man, Ya Brother Nu'man, Barakallahu feek, wa zadakallahu hirsan ala talab al ilm. May Allah bless you and rectify our condition in yours for the sake of Allah. Teach the people the Qur'an, but as per the way of the Sahaba. As per the comprehensive message of Islam. 
the people in the West, they have to adapt. Let me just give you in a nutshell what it is. The way we approach Islam is two ways. In the West, in the West, is the, the culture, the society they have is a body. And they, they tailor Islam around this body. If it's obese, they will make a big garment of Islam that will fit the obese. And if it's slim, they will make a version of Islam huh, that is slim. They will tailor Islam as to their culture, their preferences. Our approach is, you have to, Islam is the thawb, you have to fit in, ya akhi. If you're obese, lose some weight. If you're underweight, gain some weight. You have to fit into Islam. Islam is not going to change. We know there are areas of flexibility, no doubt. But we have to fit into Islam, not the other way around. Not the other way around. When you do it the other way around, you will, you will win some and you will lose a lot down the line. The Ummah, the Ummah will never ever go back to the times of, of honor and dignity until we follow the way of the Sahaba. Until we follow how the Sahaba attained this honor. Any other way will fail down the line. They tried it. The Sufis tried it. The Mu'tazila tried it. The Ashaira tried it. The, everybody has tried it. All these groups, which the Prophet told us, the Ummah will divide into how many groups, Ya Shaib? 73. He told us already, it will be 73. All of them tried. Did they, did they see the light? La Allah. We know there will be many groups who will try. They will, not, they will never make it. They will never bring the honor back until we follow that Al-Firqa Najiyah. That one saved sect. So any da'i who preaches something other than that, you can have 10 million followers, akhi. You can have a huge fan base. But subhanallah, it can all be wasted if we don't rectify the message we are delivering to the people. So instead of learning from certain individuals that are brothers in faith, but you know, don't have the, the, the things together, learn from the ulama. Their wor the works of the ulama, if you don't trust those who are alive. If you read them, you cannot possibly communicate the, the current message we hear uh, to the people. It's just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't add up. Al-Fudayl said, whoever loves a person of bid'ah, Allah will nullify his deeds and remove the light of Islam from his heart. He also said, whoever glorifies an innovator, he has aided in the destruction of Islam. This summarizes the message. We have to understand that on that platform of speakers, we would love sincerely that we can treat them all equally, take from them knowledge equally, and all of them can be guide to us to Jannah. Wallahi, we would love. It's a dream. It's the dream that we dream about. But reality is not like that. We have to be selective. We have to choose who we take this deen from. Because unfortunately, unintentionally, some people misguide in the name of guidance. We assume the best about them, but the end result is misguidance. So we have to be concerned. Brother Nurman, please don't be offended. Understand that this is because of the concern we have for the Muslims. No one is saying that we're better than you. In the sight of Allah, you can be far better. We're only dealing with what is related to the people. That has to be addressed. This is not a personal attack. This is not out of hatred. This is for the well-being of the Muslims. The Muslims who follow you, huh? some of them are rational. Some of them have completely been blinded by their love and obsession. And you have to be careful of this fitna. So they're all in your neck. If you were to tell them to kill themselves, some of them might. This is how bad... It seems, this is how bad this, this the craziness that is going on in the comments. People are going berserk. That he was attacked or someone spoke about him. And Alatul, all those who spoke about them are a bunch of clowns. Because they attacked their, their idol. We don't have this in Islam. These du'at, like if the ulama, the ulama, the senior scholars, they don't allow this type of treatment, nor are we allowed to treat them like this let alone a speaker, a public speaker, who knows his own limits, tells you, don't ask me whether smoking is haram or makruh. I'm not qualified. Zalla khair. If he knows his limits, then these limits apply in other areas. According to the same limits, don't mention aqeedah. 
According to the same limits, don't take a swipe at other du'at and say that they're making things difficult for the people. According to the same limits, this is all the same thing. We cannot apply it when we want and remove it when we don't want it. It's the whole thing. So please accept this advice. Don't take it in a negative way. And we assume that he will change, inshallah. We assume based on what we see from what appears to be sincerity, we assume sincerity, the brother seems to be very sincere. He has dedicated many years in studying and learning. He's done a lot for the ummah, which a lot of us have not even come close to, no doubt, no doubt. Based on a person with such sincerity, we assume that he will take this ad, a constructive criticism and rectify. If he has any questions, I'm sure if he asks scholars other than the ones he has chosen, he will get other opinions. If he's going to ask the same people he's been asking, then surely we will never agree. But we have to be fair. We have to be fair. Ask the other people. My concern is not really him as much as my concern is about the followers. Those who think that we're, it's all out, out of hate. Please, you owe it to yourself to investigate. Allah Azza wa Jal gave you intellect and gave you the faculties and the means to investigate. No speaker is infallible. And always look at the core message. If the core message is Islam, as per the understanding of the righteous predecessors, you're good to go. If it's anything other than that, leave it. Leave it alone. Watch the lecture, the saved and aided sect. Because I cannot give you the lecture. Why do we stick on to the Salaf, the way of the Salaf? The way, some people hate it, you know? So you say all the slogan you keep repeating the way of the Salaf. Yeah, relax you and the Salaf. They don't, they, don't like this. they don't like this message. We say, Wallahi, this is our honor and dignity. We adhere to this to the bone. Because this is, what, this, this is the only trait of the people who will succeed according to the Prophet ﷺ and according to the Quran. وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْمُهَاجِرُونَ مِنَ الْأَنصَارِ رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه الله عز وجل gave this declaration those, those the forerunners the foremost among the muhajirin ansar and all those who follow them huh? on their path Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him it's those who have been given this teskiyah no one else so the followers have to understand that this is the way the way of the salaf without going to those others who may Allah guide them repel the people you know lie against the people Claim things that are not true. Anyone who's there, they just chop him in half, in pieces, anything, just anything to make people stay away from him without any just cause sometimes. Sometimes it's obviously there and accurate. But not always. And they're also doing a lot of damage. Huh? Because now anyone, someone, ah, Salafi. Salafi Wahhabi, Psh, turn off the video. Don't watch this YouTube channel. Because this is the, these are the comments you get. So we, you know, a lot of damage has been done in the name of Salafiyya that now anyone who says Salaf is alatul, branded, once he's branded, his da'wah is turned off. Subhanallah. Subhanallah how successful the shaitan made this. How he kept the people away from the way of the Salaf because of the mispresentation of some. We go with the balance. We are balanced. Ummatan wasata. We're balanced in everything. So we neither go with those extremes, nor do we go hang out with Hamza Yusuf and Habib al-Jifri and Amr Khalid. I mean, come on. Hamza Yusuf, before, you know, there was ambiguity about his Sufism. Did, I just saw a lecture on YouTube. It said, uh, what? Shakespeare, a Sufi approach. Or I was like, what? This is the title of the lecture. Shakespearean, I don't know what, you know, I don't know what the connection is. It's a very academic. If you hear the lecture, it's like, Wow. You know, so much knowledge about, you know, what Shakespeare and the sonnets of Shakespeare. And the, the title of the lecture is a Sufi approach or Sufi analysis or Sufi perspective. Sufi perspective. Like it's clear cut, ya akhi, it's right in your face, ya sheikh. He says, aqidah you can learn in a few days. You don't need aqidah. That's what, that's what Hamza Yusuf says. That's now what Nu'man Khan says. Yasir Qadi says, uh, this, uh, Umar would fail in the aqidah. Nu'man Khan said, Ibrahim would fail in the aqidah. I forgot to quote this. May Allah forgive us and forgive him. He said, Ibrahim would fail in the Aqidah. So he hears, he learns from these people, he conveys to the people. Akram Nadawi said, men and women were mixing. Now he says, men and women were mixing. So because of the lack of that foundation of the way of the Salaf, he becomes just a, an effective communicator with very eloquent speech. And the Prophet said that bayan, there's sihr, there's magic in bayan. Some people are blessed, ya akhi. They're blessed in the way they speak. 
So they captivate the people. So when you pick up garbage and you relay it, then it remains to be garbage. No matter how beautiful you make it, it's garbage at the end. So you know, what, what he's learning from these people is what's harming us. Learn from others, you will see a whole nother Islam. Whom we hope Allah Azza wa will guide us and guide him too. هذا والله أعلم وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد. Do you have any questions? Yes. Now, بارك الله فيك. What advice do you give in terms of shading the material uh, that is written comes on WhatsApp and Facebook and other things in regards to that? What advice do I give about sharing the material that comes on WhatsApp? Which material? Uh, material that, uh, about uh, no man will stand. Uh, meaning... Uh, like p- people are sharing a video clip or... No, I mean, and I, I personally would say until it's rectified, nothing. Because you don't know where the calamity is. I, again, I, I look at the, the, the time. I'm looking at recent lectures. One was in IDB, one was in, in Jeddah. Recent, all these are recent. I'm looking at the recent lectures. This is where this issue is becoming prevalent now. You know, these subliminal messages unintentionally, may Allah forgive us and forgive him. Unintentionally, I'm still giving him the benefit of the doubt until the last second. Unintentionally, but the, the, what he has been poisoned with from the people, this is what now he's communicating consistently. Versus when you listen to Juzu Amma, it was nothing. Juzu Amma was pure, you know, approach to tafsir uh, with some little things here and there, but things which you can easily, you must overlook. When a da'i speaks, you must overlook these little mistakes which you all make. So, but nowadays, uh, no, it's a, it's a whole other story. So I'm afraid to tell you, go ahead, and then it will backfire. Because again, the people that are recipients, some of, some of them have enough knowledge to filter. Say, ah, okay, this one, well, you know, will go in the garbage disposal. And some of them are open ears, especially when they are so impressed and the speech is so eloquent and he had a good Im- uh, effect on their life. He was the reason behind the guidance. Oh, khalas. They open their chest all the way and they'll take in everything. And when you try to highlight it, they will defend. No, no, don't say this. He didn't mean it. He, they tell you what he meant. They, they, they reach a point and tell you, no, he didn't mean this. He meant that. Ya Sheikh, he didn't even say he didn't mean it. They will speak on his intentions behalf. It's amazing, yani. So you have to be careful, Allah Amstan. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes. The brother is asking, somebody told me on the Facebook to repeat the questions. He's asking, can we highlight the importance of Arabic so we don't have to depend on anyone, whether it is brother Nu'man Khan or anyone in the da'wah, uh, as a translator, more or less, uh, so that we don't depend on them and we can learn the Quran directly. For sure, the Arabic language is the key. Until now, no matter how many lectures you've heard, when you are in taraweeh, you will never get that emotional state until you know Arabic. You will never reach that khushu' which is an expectation from every believer, huh? That when they hear, uh, either, uh, when they hear the verse of Allah Azza wa Jal, qulubuhum, their hearts tremble, right? When the ayat of Allah Azza wa Jal is recited, zadathum iman, and it will increase them. You will not reach this point until you know what Allah Azza wa Jal is saying. So surely we've said many times, learning Arabic is key. But the, the issue I say may be, you know, by the time I learn Arabic and understand, so I can use the, you know, the brother until, which is fine. You know, anyone who can simplify it or can give us some sort of shortcut until we have learned, there's no harm in benefiting from this person. But provided that the message is, you know, uh, authentic. If it's authentic, we would all say, learn as much as you can from the tafsir of Nu'man Khan. No problem, until you've learned Arabic. Now, our problem is not that. Our problem is that the message is mixed. There are some elements in it that must be removed for the purity of the message to be maintained. And then we can use that until we have learned Arabic. But Arabic is ultimately the key. Naam, inshallah. Any other questions? Can you learn Arabic from the one Ali Khan, like uh, that he was translating the meaning of the Quran? And uh, is there any problem in that area? Or is it the Aqidah and 
I cannot answer because I have not uh, attended or I have not looked at any of the notes of the Arabic classes. I don't know whether there's an integration because see, when, when he, in one of his videos, he explained to the people how he does his work. And he quoted all the books he learns from. He mentioned al, al Zamakhshari, he mentioned a bunch of, of uh, Mu'tazili scholars that he refers to in his tafsir. Right? Mu'tazili is someone who has an issue with the Aqeedah of Al-Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And he did highlight that he's not with his Atizal, Zalla Khair, just to be too fair to, with the brother. The same way in one lecture he did mention that Allah Azza is above the heavens, which is amazing, the conflict. But anyways, uh, so I don't know what is being taught in the Arabic class. Is there any mix of that Arabic with Islamic content or is it pure linguistic? Pure linguistic, we will say, then that person, if he's not poisoned with the whole message, he's able to take the Arabic and avoid the rest, no issue. But you cannot say this to everyone, because usually when they see, they're so mesmerized with the Arabic, they will just take everything else. Yeah, you will, you'll be afraid that it, it will lure them in. So it's like a bait when you get a fish, you know? So it depends on the person really. You cannot say everybody can take the Arabic, ignore the rest. Nor can you say that no one should be able to benefit from the Arabic if they're able to filter out, you know, what's good and what's bad. So what's the best way to learn Arabic if, uh, if you are not going to learn from the Maya? Ask the people who learn English. What's the best way to learn English? They will tell you immersing yourself in the language. The person for Arab, an Arab who wants to learn English, what's the best way to learn English? Usually it is, he reads, Arabic, uh, he reads English, he speaks English, he writes English, he goes to an institute, Ma'had, he takes classes, you know, and he immerses himself in the language until he becomes fluent. And that's the way to learn Arabic. But not the broken Arabic we have here. This is not really Arabic. <laughs> you have to, you know, be in the presence of students of knowledge who are speaking actual fusha. And ta fi kwayis, ana ma fi kwayis. Ma fi mushkila, fi mushkila. Jeep fulus, bukra iji, wahad sandwich. Ma, this is. People say they learn and say, khalas, mashallah, I speak Arabic. That's not Arabic. That's mashi halak. Zakallah khair. What is your recommendation uh, regarding learning Arabic from Naman Khan, even though at the times. He does quote references from Al-Qur'an. That, that was the question that came a little too late. So I just answered it. And if he quotes from the Qur'an, then again I would be worried. Because for example, in the tafsir of Ayat al-Kursi, in the tafsir of Ayat al-Kursi, again, some of these I didn't highlight in the lecture purposely, so the people will not think that we're just hunting for mistakes. Because some, some areas, some scholars have said that position, so we gave them the benefit of the doubt. Even though the... The Ahl Sunnah al Jama'a believe Al Kursi huh, is the footstool of Allah Jalla Jalalu. And the Kursi is not like the Arsh. So the Arsh is unlike the Kursi. And the Kursi is unlike the heavens. And the heavens are unlike the earth. They have this kind of categorization. But in his tafsir of Ayat al Kursi, he said it is the dominion. It is the dominion of the heavens and the earth. So see here, Kursi, which has Ibn Abbas specifically said what it mentions. And they are a hadith which are authentic. One at least one authentic hadith about what the kursi is, that has been ignored, and kursi is being said to the people as a, it's a, it's a, an embodiment of the dominion of Allah Azza wa Jal. So this is where you can fall into the trap of the aqidah. Whereas if you go to IslamQA.info or .com for those who are outside the kingdom, and you look up this, uh, you know what is the kursi or what the, in ayat al kursi, you'll see a very scholarly breakdown. And a lot of references from the Sahaba as to what the Kursi is in the Aqid of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And it is not the dominion. It is an actual creation of Allah Jalla Jalalu. Because what does Allah say in the Quran? وَيَحْمِلُ عَرْشَ رَبِّكَ يَوْمَئِذٍ فَوْقَمْ يَوْمِذْ ثَمَيُّ نعم. So in, the, in the, the explanation of Arsh, because they also say Arsh is the Kursi, and that means dominion. How can the angels be carrying the dominion of Allah Azza wa Jal? It has to be the actual Arsh. Musa alayhi salam, when after the sa'iqah, Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, would see Musa hanging from the arsh of Allah azza wa jal. So it wouldn't add up, you know, these, these evidences wouldn't add up. Jazakallah khair, ahsant barakallah fi. They wouldn't add up. So if he's mentioning some Quranic references in the Arabic course, I would be worried as well if the person doesn't have the foundations. Any other questions?
I guess it's enough for now. Zakum al khair. Subhanakallah, bihamdik, shalallahu alayhi wa sallam, astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk.